Hi guys, it's your science teacher here with another video. This time it is all on a physics topic, which is waves. Waves is a really interesting topic, so I hope you enjoy the video. And please remember, if you do like the video, please subscribe to my channel. Remember, I am also making resources for my channel, which you can find in the description. first thing we need to know about a wave is what a wave actually is and it is something that transfers energy. Uh, we can see that a wave transfers energy and not actually matter. In If you send a ripple uh, along water you'll see that the uh, anything floating will just bounce up and down. It will not actually travel in the direction of that wave. And there are two types of waves. The first type of wave we are going to look at is called transverse waves. And this is what a transverse wave looks like. And transverse waves have some key features. If I look at the top of my wave here, that is called my peak. And that's quite easy to remember. I just think of like a peak of a mountain. And the bottom of my wave is called a trough. Now the difference between two peaks or two troughs is known as the wavelength and this is the distance uh, travelled by the wave in one full cycle. You could pick the wavelength in fact to be down here and just for one full cycle this here would also be the wavelength. You also need to know about the amplitude and that's the distance between the peak or the trough and this point here, which is called the equilibrium line. Um, and it's just halfway between the peak and trough. And this is known as our amplitude, sometimes just called the height of the wave. Now, the key thing in a transverse wave is that the wave will be traveling in this direction. And the vibrations of the particles will be up and down so the vibrations are perpendicular or 90 degrees to the direction of travel. The other type of wave is called a longitudinal wave and that looks like this and a longitudinal wave uh, is characterized by compressions and rarefactions. Compressions are areas of high density and rarefactions are areas where the density is lower. There's smaller pressure in that area and uh, the waves are more spread out. So the difference between a transverse and a longitudinal wave is the wave will be traveling in this direction. However, the particles will no longer be vibrating perpendicular to the direction of travel. They will be uh, vibrating um, parallel to the direction of travel. You can still work out a wavelength for a longitudinal wave. That's just the distance between uh, compressions or distance between rarefactions is known as the wavelength for a longitudinal wave. There are also a couple more definitions you need to know about your waves. And the first one is frequency. And the frequency of a wave is how many waves pass a certain point per second and it is measured with the unit of hertz. The other uh, key definition you need to know is period and that is the time it takes for one full cycle of a wave. And these two are interlinked with the triangle. You know that I like to use triangles um, when doing calculations. Uh, frequency equals 1 over period or period equals 1 over frequency. Uh, this T represents period and the F is frequency. We could actually calculate the speed of the wave if we know the frequency because wave speed equals frequency times by the wavelength and 
the wavelength, depending on what type of wave it, it will be, will either be in meters, millimeters, micrometers, or nanometers. And if I'm to put that into a triangle, that would look like this with wave speed on the top and frequency and wavelength on the bottom. So you can use that triangle, of course, to rearrange the equation to get all the other parameters. It's also important to remember that the speed of electromagnetic waves, and I'll write this down, even though we're not covering EM waves in this topic, uh, that we've got a whole video on that, and that's the next video. The speed of EM waves in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. The speed of waves also explains a property of transverse waves. Transverse waves travel fastest through a gas rather than a solid and that explains why light refracts when it goes through a glass or perspex block. You might have done this practical at school and what you did was you shined a ray box at your uh, glass or perspex and you saw that light refract and then leave uh, the box. And the angle that the light comes in as, known as the angle of incidence, is always greater than the angle of refraction. And that's because of the fact that what is happening is the light is going through this perspex block, the solid, and slowing down. That's causing its angle to change, and when it leaves the block just here, it will start to speed up again. Now, the opposite thing is observed with a longitudinal wave. They travel fastest through solids, and the reason for that is longitudinal waves need vibration. So longitudinals travel fastest in solids and transverse waves travel fastest in gases. Also, depending on the material, depends on the critical angle of uh, what happens to the light. For example, if this light is shone in and you go past a certain angle, it will no longer travel through the block. If it's really dense, the critical angle will be lower um, and it will actually reflect off. And the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection if something is reflecting off. And that's called the critical angle when reflection starts to occur. We looked at the properties of reflection and refraction for transverse waves. Now what we're going to do is we are going to look more at longitudinal waves. And a lot of the time, actually, we convert longitudinal waves into transverse waves to understand them. So, for example, sound is a very typical longitudinal wave. Uh, we will convert it into a transverse wave to see some of the properties of it. So if we look at two transverse waves showing sound, I know sound is a longitudinal wave. However, using an oscilloscope, I can turn it into a transverse wave. It will look a bit like this. And what I could do is I can change about my wave, my pitch and my volume. Uh, so what I mean by that is I can change the frequency of my wave and my volume. This here is I'm changing the frequency. That would mean my voice would sound a lot higher in the oscilloscope if I was to do this. And you might have had your teacher doing this, uh, pulling many bit different funny uh, sounds down the oscilloscope. I can also change the uh, loudness of my um voice and I can show if my voice is going louder then this is what would be shown on the oscilloscope and if I was to make my voice really low 
than the oscilloscope would show something like this, okay? Because of the fact my pitch has changed and this is what my oscilloscope would be showing. So what you've seen here is that transverse waves are a good way to represent longitudinal waves and in particular sound waves. And from these transverse waves, we can look at the pitch. So whether it's high or low and the loudness. So as I said, the pitch is controlled by the frequency. So this would be a really high pitch, like a squeak, like a maybe like a mouse. Uh, this would be uh, a really low pitch wave. And here I've changed the amplitude, so I'm really loud, and here I'm quiet. A really cool property of sound waves comes in when we start looking at something called ultrasound. And what ultrasound basically is, is a really high frequency sound wave. And an example of an animal that uses ultrasound is bats. And you probably know how bats use ultrasound. They use ultrasound to track down the prey and make sure they do not bump into things. So how a bat uses ultrasound is what they do is they fire out this high pitch frequency sound. And if it hits something, for example, a little fly or a mosquito, then that will reflect back at it and it will pick it up in its ear and it will know how far away it is, depending on how long that reflection took to come back to the bat. Now, humans also have been using ultrasound for years. They've been using it on boats to detect uh, where fish are in the sea. What they do is they send down this high frequency sound wave. If it hits some fish, then it will bounce back to the boat and it will tell them that there is fish underneath the boat because it took less time for that sound to travel back than usual. You can actually quantifiably tell how far away the fish are as well. This is because of the fact we know that speed equals distance divided by time. And we will know for sure the speed of sound waves through different materials. Because of the fact that it's having to go from the ship to the material and back up to the ship means that I have to times it by a half though. So distance is half times the speed, which we know is a constant, times the time it took to come back up to the ship. Scientists have used transverse and longitudinal waves to work out what the earth is actually made of and also to see what whether the earth contains solid liquid or gas in each one of its layers because of the fact we can't actually drill to the center of the earth we've had to use waves to work out what our earth is made of and how they have done that is by using earthquakes and looking at uh, where then waves have come out of the earth. For example, if an earthquake has occurred here, what we notice is that we get two waves emitted by an earthquake. They are P waves and we also have S waves. And the way I remember which way round it is, S kind of looks like a transverse wave and so that's transverse and P waves are longitudinal. Now, the S waves can only travel through solids. <clears throat> and this has proven that the, that the core, the outer core, I mean, must be liquid because of the fact when the earthquake has happened, we've noticed that the waves will not travel through this liquid core. That's why you cannot detect S waves down here. So we know that our, we must have a liquid outer core. P waves, they can travel, okay, they can travel uh, through solids and liquids and they can travel through this uh, liquid core and this means that there's only a smaller shadow zone 
And the reason why you get this shadow zone is from a reason that we've already looked at. That's caused by refraction. Okay, these waves get refracted when they enter the, solid, uh, the liquid outer core. They actually slow down uh, when they go through the liquids and that causes this shadow zone here. That is the end of the video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Please remember, if you did enjoy the video, please drop it a like and subscribe to the channel.